So what I'll do is I'll quickly go over uh, what we were doing yesterday, and then by the time people come in, we can start with the new stuff, right? Uh, so we were looking at uh, so the TS. Uh, so this needs to be corrected. Someone pointed out yesterday. Uh, same as bag of words. Uh, it should be same problems as the bag of words model, right? Uh, okay. So we were trying to fix this problem where we have this large softmax computation, which is very inefficient. And we wanted ways of getting rid of that. So the first thing that we were looking at is using negative sampling, right? And here the key idea was to con construct this D and D prime, where D prime was a random corpus and D was a true corpus, right? And how do you create this random corpus is something that was left at the end and which I need to go over today. So I'll go over that. And then we realized that this actually could be modeled using such a network where you take the dot product between the word representations right and try to maximize this to dot product for all the correct pairs by setting up your loss function accordingly and try to maximize or rather minimize this dot product minimize this dot product for all the incorrect pairs by again setting the obje objective function appropriately right so we had this uh, objective function where we want to maximize the probability that the pair is correct for the correct pairs and maximize the probability but the, that the pair is incorrect for the incorrect pairs. And both these probabilities we had modeled using a sigmoid function. And inside the sigmoid function, we had the dot product between the corresponding representations. So the net effect is you either maximize the dot product of the correct pairs or minimize the dot product of the, or rather and in minimize the dot product of the incorrect pairs, fine. And then, uh, so now today the part which was remaining about the comparison between D and D prime. So what I was saying uh, last time is that D prime is actually K times D. That means you sample more negative examples than positive examples. So if you think about it, actually the number of negative examples in the language is much, much more than the number of positive examples. Right? So if you have 50K words in your vocabulary, most of them don't appear together. Right? So that number is actually very, very large as compared to the number of words which can occur together. Right? So how do you account for this natural imbalance? So they said that, okay, if you keep it same, then we are saying that the size of D prime and D is going to be same. That means the words which appear together and not to appear together, we are keeping those two corpora as the same. So that doesn't sound reasonable. So they decided that we'll keep it K times, okay. Now this K was a hyperparameter which was tuned based on the data that they had. And can you guess how they would have tuned it? Now what do you tune your parameters on? What did, how did you tune your parameters for the back propagation? No, using what? A validation set. Is it too early in the morning? Is it fine? Validation set? Okay. So they might have had some validation set. And if you look at the original word to vec code, which someone had posted yesterday, uh, which allows you to compute the distance metric, right? So you could, uh, what you could do is you could learn these representations, take a few pairs of words, and take a few pairs of good words, right? say cat and dog or cat and feline and so on. And also bad words like cat and truck, bad combinations rather. And see if the distance between cat and truck is much higher than the distance between cat and feline or cat and dog. right? So you select that K which gives you the best performance on your validation set. And the validation set here would essentially be to find if you get good representations for word pairs that you care about and for word pairs that you don't care about, okay. Uh, now the other thing was how do you create this R, okay. So you have V words in the vocabulary, you are looking at one of those W. You know that some of those have appeared with W in some context, but there is this large set which has not appeared with W in any context, right. So you are going to draw R from this set. Now the simplest thing to do would be to just draw with uniform distribution. That means all words and let's call this, suppose there are capital R words here, all of these words could be drawn from using the probability 1 by R, right, where R is less than V. Is that fine? That's one way of doing it, just randomly pick any word from the remaining words and put it, uh, pair it with W. But you would also want to account for the individual frequencies of those words, right. If the word is actually very frequent, pair it up more with W. If it's not frequent, don't pair it up enough. Does that make sense? 
So I could actually use the frequencies of each of these words and sample according to that frequency, right? Instead of using a unigram distribution. So they did something similar, but they had this hyperparameter again. So basically, I was sampling using the probability of R, which is equal to count of R divided by the number of times, number of all the words in the corpus. That's actually the frequency of R divided by the total number of words in the corpus. So instead of just taking that, they had this weird factor of 3 by 4. They realized that if you take this 3 by 4, you get the best performance. Okay. So let me just make a few comments on that. So the original code of or rather the original uh, skip gram or the bag of words model actually worked very well and it kind of uh, uh, had a lot of some minor effect or a lot of uh, revolutionary effect on the field of NLP, right. So now everyone started talking about word vectors and how you can use this meaningful representations of words as features for various downstream NLP tasks, right. So at the end in NLP what you are doing is you are collecting a bunch of words, a document or a sentence or something and trying to do some processing on that. Now, earlier you used to construct features out of these sentences using some handcrafted features, but now someone said that there is this automatic way of constructing uh, word features, right, which is using this uh, method. So people really bought onto that idea and a lot of work started happening. Uh, and then later on at the end of the course, we will see something that what it eventually led to. But later on when people started uh, analyzing this more carefully, right, they realized that the original word to make implementation had a lot of these uh, heuristics, a lot of these parameters which needed to be really tuned to the core for it to be able to compete with SVD, right. So that is what we will look at at the end. So SVD was already one way of computing word representations, uh, which while popular was not so popular. Uh, it was used for various reasons, but it was not like every NLP application is using uh, SVD representations, right. But now it is almost like every NLP application is using word representations. Uh, so later on we will see that some of these things like 3 by 4 or k, the value of k, the value of learning rate and some other hyperparameters, if you really tune them very, very well, it is only then that S, uh, this word to wake algorithm can beat the word representations learned by SVD, right. Or rather the other thing that if you introduce some parameters in SVD and tune them, because remember for SVD there was no tuning, right? We just got a solution. We just had the closed form solution, which is the eigenvectors. But you could do some things for creating the co-occurrence matrix. If you introduce some factor there, which is also looks like this 3 by 4 or something like that, or if you also introduce something which looks like a K, then you will be able to get the same kind of representations or uh, equally powerful representations from SVD as what you get from word to word. Okay, so that is why I am stressing on these hyperparameters. There is some significance of those. 